Well, good morning, everyone. I think we'll go ahead and get started. It's uh, great to see you all with us. Uh, thank you all for uh, attending our course. This is our last, uh, our last time together, although we will have a Wednesday night Q&A session for those who would like to join us again. That will be at 630 here at the church in room 100. Uh, and so before we get started today, let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer. Dear God, just thank you for today. Just thank you for uh, your love for us, Lord, and uh, the fact that you're with us in all situations. Just thank you for the fact that in you we can, um, Lord, just work through the, ch the challenges that we face, knowing that you're with us and that, that you've equipped us with your spirit to deal with those issues and that no matter what we may be going through, we still have the opportunity to experience you in the midst of those circumstances and also reflect uh, your glory uh, in the world that you put us in uh, to impact those around us for your glory. And God, just uh, bless this time together as we continue to look at this issue of how we can uh, deal with the challenges of anxiety and depression uh, in the life of a Christian and uh, just bless this time together in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so uh, again, this is our last lesson. Uh, for those of y'all coming in, there is a class evaluation form in lieu of a test. Uh, I thought about a test, but this is a class on anxiety, right? <laughs> so uh, I decided not to uh, do that. And on the evaluation, they give you a lot of little multiple choice questions to make it less anxiety prone. So you can just check boxes, so okay. Uh, so as you know, we've been looking at the topic of anxiety and depression from a Christian perspective, both the physiologically, uh, the, the physiology, the uh, psychology and spiritual components. And we've been trying to mix together some uh, biblical structure for that as well as some practical steps. And we'll try to do that again today. Uh, and, the, and the key emphasis here is not looking for uh, how we can make necessarily our anxiety and uh, depression go away, but how we can see how God can transform that so that in that we can still glorify God and reflect his glory to the world. Because that's ultimately um, uh, what God wants us to do. And I think that we have a lot of biblical examples to, to illustrate that. And I'll try to uh, highlight a few of those today. So Believe it or not, we've actually made it through all this material. Uh, if you've printed out everything I've given you, you should have a decent-sized notebook by now. Um, but today we're going to be looking at sort of the third step in the, uh, the cognitive element that we talked about, how do we handle our, our thoughts and emotions. And we're going to be looking at a concept I call non-judgmental or biblical acceptance, uh, which is, I think, really sort of the last piece and sometimes the hardest piece to implement in dealing and managing our thoughts and emotions. And I'll try to give you some insights into that concept. So two weeks ago, I gave you sort of a, a, a three-part biblical strategy that Paul lays out in, in of 2 Corinthians about the whole issue of uh, our mind and our thoughts. And he, he uses somewhat of a, uh, a picture that we're in some kind of spiritual battle. This kind of co coincides with what Herschel's been talking about in Ephesians, but the fact that, that we're in a, a battle not only with um, spiritual forces, but also we're somewhat in a battle with ourselves, right? We have our mind that we've talked about that can generate uh, emotional responses that we really have no control over and also involuntary thoughts. And so how do we, how do we engage or interact with those forces? And so kind of taking that passage and working backward, uh, one of the, the, the admonitions is to take every thought captive to obey Christ. And we use that as a context to introduce a concept of Christ, Christian mindfulness, being able to step away from your thoughts, disengage from that, be able to observe those, and then re-engage uh, with Christ through the Holy Spirit. Uh, last week, we, we really looked at the whole concept of what influences some of that, and we, we looked at three things, really, our perspectives that can be influenced by our experience, experiences and memories, and so we talked about how to evaluate the perspectives that we're using. We also looked in the belief system that maybe we've accumulated over time, 
the fact that we may be believing certain things that are not true and how they can affect uh, our thoughts and the way we approach things. Uh, and then we uh, also looked at judgments that we tend to make. Uh, many times we make false judgments, judgments about others, our circumstances, and ourselves, and how those can be counterproductive, again, uh, to our mental health. So the last thing I want to look at is uh, really a concept of, of acceptance, and I'll, and I'll try to be specific what I mean by that word, because that word tends to have different connotations to different people. It tends to have its own somewhat baggage. Uh, some people have suggested maybe acceptance is a, uh, a bad, or not a bad, but maybe a, a deficient term, maybe the, the concept of willingness is, is, a, is a better concept. And I'll try to differentiate those two. Okay, so as an engineer, I have to have a flow chart. Um, so I've, I've tried to lay out this kind of cascade of anxiety that we've talked about. We have either external sources. We looked at a lot of different stressors in our lives. We can also have internal stressors. We may be dealing, dealing with uh, physiological problems, chemical imbalances, and so on. Either one of those can cause stressors in our life that can trigger uh, emotions that we have no control over. It's a biological response, although we sense these. We can also have involuntary thoughts that may coexist with those, and both of those can tend to, to create some kind of, of physiological or emotional or mental disturbance that we're aware of. Uh, we're in some situation and we start to feel or sense something that, that we perceive as being negative, okay? So a lot of times what we do is we, we kind of what, employ what I would call sort of a mindless response to that, where we tend to kind of merge with our emotions and thoughts and we, we, we tend to think of these as, this is me, all right? And so mindfulness, as we've talked about, is being able to separate that. So mindlessness is really mingling yourself, your true self, and identifying that with your, your thoughts and your emotions. We then tend to get into the cycle of starting to ruminate or think about these things. Uh, this can then tend to generate feelings of panic or depression. And sort of the normal response to that type of, situation is to do something to avoid that. We want to get away from that because it's, it's not comfortable, right? That's kind of built in a physiological natural response, but we've adapted that in sort of a mental response. And so we tend to then act on things that are not true. We've got things that we've, we've learned or believed and we start taking actions to enable us to avoid or get away from that discomfort. Uh, can you can you think of some possible lies that might fall under that category? What things might we believe that are going to help our situation in the context of avoiding a discomfort? If I get away from it, I'll be doing better. Yeah, if I can get away from it, I'll do better. What what are some what are, are some of the things that people do to try to get away from discomfort? Okay. Okay, that's a good point. Uh, what are some other things people do in society to try to deal with their discomfort? They may get involved in more work. They may get involved in recreational activities more. Okay. Drink. They could absolutely. We have an epidemic in our country with opioid uh, addiction, right? A lot of that's people are, are are not taking drugs to feel better. They're taking drugs to avoid pain. I'm not talking about physical pain but psychological and discomfort pain, okay? So there's a lot of things, and we think that's gonna make things better. That's the whole reason we have an epidemic of, of drug addiction with opioids, because people believe the lie that if I take this, it's gonna make things go away. And it do, the problem is, it does give you temporary relief. That's why it's so insidious. And so there's a feedback that make you think, oh, I did this, it's working, okay? The problem is, it ultimately just makes things worse. And the same thing is true not only of, of physiological strategies we may use, they're also true of mental strategies that we tend to start employing, okay? And we've looked a little bit. So what those do is then they, because of the temporary relief, that tends to reinforce the lie that we believed, and we, it kind of makes it, you know, that's true, it, it did get better, okay? And so we get locked into this, 
we get locked into this loop because the reinforcement of lies ultimately doesn't make things better in the long run. Ultimately, it just makes things worse. And so our anxiety and depression keep coming back, and it keeps getting worse, and we get locked into this cycle, okay, this sort of illogical cycle. And really the key here, as I'm going to talk about today, is this mental decision to try to avoid the discomfort that we're experiencing. All right? So avoidance of discomfort is something that we've all kind of been taught we should do. We have a whole media. You turn on the television, you're constantly bombarded with take this drug to get rid of your discomfort, et cetera. All right? I'm not talk- now, I'm not saying that that medicines can be useful to help physical pain and things like that. I'm talking about sort of this getting into this cycle, the way we think about things. Always, We always want to avoid negative things as a positive strategy. Okay. So the other approach we could take, and this is the one we've kind of been walking through, is this concept of mindfulness. Here it's in emerging with our emotions and our feelings. We, we want to separate from those so we can distinguish these as things that not are not me, are not defining me. They're things that, are I'm, that I'm experiencing, okay? There's sort of a difference between my identity and my experience. Our identity is not tied up into what we experience. As Christians, our identity is tied up in what? It's tied up in Christ, okay? So if, if I do that, the, the, the idea we looked at was to separate through mindfulness. Last week, we talked about renewal strategies, how we can start replacing the lies that we've been leave, believing the problem with that is that's going to still leave some discomfort. All right, why is that? Because we're still broken, we're still feeling this discomfort. However, if we learn to accept the discomfort, okay, that's still going to leave us with some temporary pain or discomfort, but ultimately, as we, we do that, we then have the choice now to believe the truth, exercise our faith, act on the truth, and, and as we do that, we can come to experience and reflect God's glory. And the benefit of that, by accepting things, is the side benefit is ultimately that strategy will start to lead to a decrease in the anxiety and depression that you, you tend to experience. Okay? It's somewhat paradoxical, but that's the way things work. And part of the reason is because it requires us to take an action of faith and trusting God in the midst of that situation instead of trying to take on the situation and, and, and come up with a solution ourselves. So there's really an underlying spiritual concept that really addresses the way we physically work and the, and the way we physically operate. And there's lots of biblical examples I'll try to kind of highlight to you. All right, so this concept of learning to live with the discomfort after you've implemented mindfulness and you've, you've starting to repl- you're replacing uh, lies, you're still going to have this, this continuing level of discomfort because you've built it into your system over years, right? This is not going to go away magically. Uh, so you're going to have to learn how to deal with that and accept that. So to do that, I would characterize that activity as what I call biblical acceptance. So here's a definition, the voluntary adoption of an intentionally open, receptive, and non-judgmental posture with, with respect to moment to moment experiences, including negative thoughts and voluntary thoughts that might pop in my head and my, and my emotions, with the objective of not trying to make them go away, those experiences, but to give me space so I can still keep my focus on Christ and still trust him and act on his truth and pursue that relationship. Okay. So, well, I'm not proposing is acceptance as a way to make your discomfort go away. It's a way to open up enough room so that you can still follow Christ in the midst of that situation. Okay? And the Holy Spirit and Scripture promise that we have the power to do that. As we look over in Philippians 4, when Paul talks about, I've learned the secret of contentment, he's talking about, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What he can do specifically is he can coexist with that discomfort and still function and follow Christ, okay? And, and Holy Spirit gives us the power to do that. So another way to think about acceptance is this concept of willingness. It's a willingness to make contact with and engage in private experiences or situations that we find uncomfortable, okay? All right, so an example of that is the, is the old classical serenity prayer by Newver. 
Grant me the serenity to what? Accept. Accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. So when I'm talking about acceptance, I don't mean that we just don't ever do anything. There are certain things that, that uh, the Holy Spirit directs us to do. We need to act on those. I'm not saying you don't accept every bad situation in your life, all right? If there are things that you, steps you can take to improve that, you should do that. What I'm pointing out is a lot of the struggles that people have with anxiety and depression come about because of their unwillingness to accept the, the discomfort that they're experiencing, and they get locked into trying to get rid of that constantly, and they get trapped into this situation. It's, it's very similar to quicksand. The more you try to get out of it, the more you, you keep getting pulled into it. Okay. All right, so what, is really, what are we really talking about when we're talking about acceptance? Uh, so I'm going to try to give you different perspectives of this because it sometimes is a hard concept to grasp. Acceptance is not a technique or a method. Okay? It's, it's a functional process, the way that we're approaching our discomfort. So you might think of this as an analogy uh, as acceptance is learning to sort of climb a mountain. So at the very bottom, you have zero acceptance. At this top plateau, you have 100% acceptance. So our, our goal is to get to the top. Right, so this is a process. It takes time and, and work. It's very difficult. I've been working on this for several years. All right? It's not something you're going to accomplish uh, overnight. But ultimately, it gives you the pathway to experience freedom, even in the midst of the, the emotional distress that you may be incurring. Uh, so we have this concept of trying to climb a mountain. And the, and the sort of paradox is the closer you get to 100% acceptance, sometimes the steeper and more difficult it gets. Okay, uh, just like climbing any, any structure. So a couple of things, as I've indicated, acceptance, you might think of this as like climbing a mountain. It takes time and effort, and you will experience falls and setbacks, okay? <coughs> and part of the dynamic of acceptance is learning to live with or accept those types of setbacks. So there are times when you're going to get overwhelmed with your emotions and you're not going to be mindful. You're just going to respond or you'll act on a lie and get recycling back into this process. All right, that's going to happen. It's, it is going to happen. You need to be prepared for that. Okay? This is normal, and, but learning to accept those setbacks is part of that. Another paradox is that you will not experience true peace until you learn to practice a 100% acceptance. And so 99% of this percent acceptance is really not true acceptance. Now, that's sort of a paradoxical concept to grasp. It's something, if you've gone through this, you learn to experience. I think I am accepting a situation, but as long as I'm still holding on to a, a piece of avoidance, I'm still going to be trapped in this cycle, okay? So I don't want that to sound intimidating, but just something that for you to be aware of as you're going through this process, if you're understanding why I'm still experiencing frustration with these, these situations, is it's ultimately you go back and ask yourself the question, am I truly accepting this situation or am I still trying to take control of it? Okay. So uh, a good metaphor for acceptance is like learning to ride a bike. So remember... Uh, when you're a child or maybe as you've taught your own children how to ride a bike, what are some of the things that go along with riding a bike or learning to ride a bike? You're going to fall, okay? In order to be able to learn how to ride a bike, you're going to have to accept the fact that there's going to be falling and you might skin your knee or it could be some pain with that, okay? But that's the only way you're ultimately going to learn to ride a bike and have the freedom to move faster and move forward. Okay. What are some other things? You're going to get bruises, but you, the goal is to not look picture perfect after. So if you're picture perfect, if you're picture perfect afterwards, you know you're going through nothing. Okay. What else? There's going to be a lot of fear, fear involved in it. There's a fear that you're going to have to face to, to, to learn that? Okay. What else? You'll have successes. What's that? You will have successes, okay? Balance and perspective. Balance and perspective. If you're, if you're riding a bike and you start to fall to the right, is the strategy to keep from falling turn away from the falling? Think about that. How do you balance yourself on a bike if you're going to 
start falling. You have to turn into to that, right? The same thing is true with acceptance. So if I'm, if I'm going along and I start feeling this negative emotion, my instinct is to turn away from that. Right? But just like on riding a bike, if you turn away from that, you're going to, you're, it's going to make the situation worse. You're going to fall. It's only as you turn into and face and engage that that you're able to get restabilized. Okay. Um, so those are just a few things you can think about this metaphor. So as you learn to start practicing acceptance, recognize you're going to have the same similar experience here uh, as trying to ride a bike. Uh, when you start to ride a bike, are you thinking about all the, all the mechanisms that your body's having to do to ride the bike? You're thinking, I've got to get my foot on this pedal. I've got to push down. In the beginning stages, you are. Okay. Yeah, and, yeah, that's right. So I've got a flow chart with step one through five, right, or ten. So, okay. At the very beginning, you are, right? But after you learn to ride a bike, are you thinking about that? It's just it's not even thinking about it. The same thing true is with acceptance, right? So over time, as you start to develop this skill, you can, do, you can start to do this without thinking about it. You just do it just like riding a bicycle, okay? Yes, John? I was thinking that you actually, you can get instruction, but uh, just to actually act on it out and doing it, you, you, you can get all the tricks you want. But right. Actually, actually get out there and do it. You really start to learn. It's like learning to, to play golf by watching a video, right? Okay, you've actually got to go out there and do it. Okay. All right, so let me give you some other metaphors of acceptance. Uh, sort of quicksand is sort of the opposite, right? So if you, if you get into quicksand and the more you start struggling with it, the more you start going down into the quicksand, right? The, the <clears throat> to get out of quicksand, you need to what? You really need to relax and let the quicksand hold you up, kind of float in it to get out of it. The same thing with acceptance. You let the circumstances basically hold you up instead of fighting with them. Uh, anyone had a Chinese finger trap before? Right, so the more you try to get out of the trap, what happens? The tighter it gets, okay? What's the only way you can get out of that? Scissors. You, scissors? <laughs> you need some help with that, Keith, right? Or, or your third arm, right? Come, all right. So if you push in, though, okay, you can then, you know, kind of let gravity or you can get out of that by em embracing or accepting that tension, okay? Uh, tug of war with a monster. I love this example. So think of your anxiety and your depression as almost this monster over here, and you're in this tug of war. The monster's pulling you. You're pulling back, okay? So it, when you're in tug of war, what are you trying to do? What's the objective? Game of tug of war. Pull the other guy across. Pull the other guy across. All right. What else? Trying to bring the game to the right guy. Okay. You're are you you're trying to control the situation, right? So you're engaged in this all this energy and effort, trying to deal with your anxiety and depression. You're trying to control it. You're trying to make sure it doesn't do what. Pull you over, okay? So you're pulling back against it because you're afraid it's going to pull you over there, right? That's how we tend to look at this. I want to suggest there's a third alternative. What, what else could you do? You could just let go of the rope. Okay? And so this is, this is very relevant relative to our, this tug of war that we have with anxiety and depression there is, a, there is another alternative. Instead of fighting against that, you can simply let go of the rope. And so the concept of acceptance is analogous to letting go of the rope. Okay? I don't have to engage with that. I just accept there's the monster where they don't have to be pulling this dialogue. Okay. Okay, so that's another now. The uninvited guest. Think about you're having a party. You've got all your friends over. And there's this one person in the office that you, you were obligated to invite, but you really hope they don't show up, okay? Uh, but lo and, lo and behold, you're there, and guess who shows up to the door, okay? Uh, it's this person that no one else really wants there, and um, just very obnoxious person, and just, so they come in, and so they're just, he's going around, or she's going around, just kind of creating havoc. 
How do you react to that situation? What would be our normal emotional response? Yeah, you want to kick them out? Okay, what else? What? Avoid them. Just, just, just stay away from them. Get over the other side of the... Okay. I, I want you to kind of think about your anxiety or your depression as this uninvited guest that showed up in your mind. Okay? So, again, you can, you can be trying to avoid that. You can be just, you know, mulling over. This is terrible. I can't believe I have this thought in my head or I'm feeling this way and just going on and on, getting ruminating about this, or you could just accept this uninvited guest as a person that's there, and instead of focusing on that person, not avoid them, but focus on the other people at the party, okay? That's an option that you have, right? And and eventually, that obnoxious person is going to get tired, and he's going to leave, okay? Unless, yeah, yeah, or unless people keep engaging him, okay? So crying baby on a plane, has anybody ever gotten a plane? There's this parent with a baby that's crying coming down the aisle, and there's an open seat next to you. What are you thinking or what are you hoping? That's my wife. That's your wife. <laughs> okay. Any other responses? <laughs> Please don't go here, okay? Or, or don't sit right behind me. Or uh, has that ever happened to anybody else? This, our last flight, we had that situation. Um, so what is our attitude when they're coming? Are we, are we accepting that? Are we saying, what a cute baby? Or are we thinking about, that must be really hard for that mom? Okay. Uh, what, what about a situation if you have an open seat? Did, did you ever think, I hope she sits next to me so I can help her engage with that baby? Do we ever think of it that way? So it's a different ex- perspective, isn't it? All right. So again, that's sort of an analogy of acceptance, the way we, we look at it. Uh, choosing the wrong line, everybody ever done that? It's like, I can't believe I'm in this line. Okay. Those are all great opportunities for you to practice acceptance, by the way. Okay. All right. So if you want to start developing this skill, these are, these are great opportunities. Same thing like waiting in traffic. Uh, I'm terrible a waiter in traffic. You know, if, if I can drive uh, and be moving and go this way, and it, maybe I'm 10 minutes late, but the fact that I'm moving, that's just much better in my, my mind. But. Uh, the hungry tiger, you can almost think of your anxiety or emotions as a tiger that shows up to your door, and the more you feed it, what's going to happen? He's going to keep coming back. He's going to get bigger. He's going to grow. Okay, so we have a chance whether or not to, to feed the tiger by uh, whether or not we accept things. A ball in a pool. Anybody been in a swimming pool with one of these big balls, uh, and you try to hold it under the water? Okay, what happens when you let go? It shoots up, okay? Sometimes our anxiety is like that. We're trying to hold it under the water because we don't want to deal with it. Does that take a lot of effort? Yeah, do you get tired of doing that? All right, so if you let the ball pop up, it might sit there for a while, but it also could just drift off by on its own, right? Okay, so acceptance is like that. Just the concept of swimming, learning to swim. I remember when I learned to swim, I was terrified of water. The more I fought against the water, the more difficult it made to learn to swim. Ultimately, you know, I learned to just relax in the water, let the water support me. Still the most same terrifying thing, but now the water could basically serve me as I learned to swim, and it's supporting me as I'm going through the water. Okay. So I'm not getting out of the water. I'm learning to swim in the water. Uh, children on the bus, we've used this analogy before. Think about you're driving this bus with all these kids on, and, and that you're on the bus, they're all just going crazy. Uh, can you, you can focus totally on what they're saying and doing, or you could just not worry about that and focus on driving, okay? Learning to accept the fact that there are always going to be kids 
uh, our monsters on the bus of our mind, okay? Right? It's just learning to accept that they're there. Trusting that to Jesus to deal with that and still, st instead of you trying to do that, okay? So those are a lot of uh, metaphors that might be helpful. Again, reinforcing what I just said previously, the purpose of acceptance is not to take away my negative thoughts or emotions, or not to make them go away. Because if that becomes your objective, then you can use acceptance as a way to avoid them. And now you're back in the same cycle all over again. Okay. Yes. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, remember how the, I think, who, who said this? It was the king Nebuchadnezzar? Uh-huh. Yeah, in it's fact, yeah, exactly. I'll, I've, I've got that as a great illustration here in a second. So you're, you're one step ahead of me, Anthony. Oh, that's the exact illustration? Yeah, I've actually got one. So you're, 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 meeting, you're reading my mind. Okay. I'm a Jedi. Yeah, you are a Jedi. Okay. Uh, so, again, the purpose is not to try to make these, this dump, discomfort go away. The purpose is to allow me enough room and flexibility with my emotions and thoughts so I can still act on the truth. By that I mean experience God's glory in my situation. I can still have this vertical relationship, okay? And then I can also reflect God's glory in my situation. I can still act on what the Holy Spirit is directing me to do and impact and help other people. My anxiety and my depression do not have to prohibit, prohibit me from doing that. Our objective needs to be not to try to make those sensations and discomfort go away, go away. It's to learn how to let God use me even while I am dealing with or experiencing those situations. Does everybody understand the difference? Because if I'm pursuing the first part, I'm still trying to be in control. Really, anxiety and depression a lot of times is really reflective of a control problem. It was certainly true of my own life. I wanted to control everything because if I did not control things, then that made me feel uh, anxious or uncomfortable. So I developed lots of elaborate mental strategies to stay in control of situations. And control really paradoxically just makes you not in control. And so the only way to really get control is to give up control. Does that make sense? All right, and we can do that through acceptance. So you could, you could try to lay this out into a sort of a sequential process. We've already talked about a couple of these items. Learning to separate from emotions and voluntary thoughts through mindfulness, using those metaphors and pictures that we talked about, uh, and then stepping back and observing, what am I thinking right now? or what am I experiencing right now? Sometimes our, our emotions and our involuntary thoughts have information with them. They may not be communicating true information, but the fact that you're experiencing those things, there may be something that, that you can glean from that. The fact that I was always anxious about losing control ultimately was telling me I had a problem with control. I saw the issue is not being able to control the situation when the real problem was I was trying to control the situation and not trusting God to deal with that. What's that? Op where? It's a drug. Yeah, it's a, it's a drug. Okay. So make room is make room for emotions. Again, what that means is just trying to step away and make room in sort of like the, the, the room of your mind for the presence of these uninvited guests. The intent is not to support them, it's your, your, but the more you, you try to get rid of them, the more they're going to come back and stay, right? So it's a paradoxical strategy. Be willing to experience the discomfort while resting in your identity in Christ. So as you start to accept things, the discomfort is not going to magically disappear. Sometimes it'll, it'll become worse. But the objective needs to be not, I'm going to accept this, not to make, 
my emotions better. I'm going to accept this because it will give me the space now to focus on what Christ is directing me to do. And one of the ways we can do that is then connect with God's word. Last week we talked about a lot of ways to do that. I gave you some different examples. Uh, Biblical coding or Bible coding I kind of talked about was one way to do that. And then ultimately, like James talks about, it's not enough to know the truth. We have to act on the truth. So the key here is try to implement acceptance to give me enough room to then act on the truth and trust God in whatever happens. So what are some examples of non-acceptance? This is some of the the dialogue that would go through in a a person's mind who is not accepting things. Why am I feeling like this? What have I done to deserve this? I wish I didn't feel like this. Why won't this feeling go away? Anybody ever had those kind of dialogues? All right, so when when you're doing that, when you're ruminating that way, you are not practicing acceptance. You're doing just the opposite. You're holding on to that. You're trying to control the situation. Uh, So here's some examples of what acceptance might look like relative to uh, a voluntary dialogue. So I don't like this feeling. So acceptance doesn't mean that you like what you're experiencing. It just says, I'm not going to control what I'm experiencing. Does everyone understand the, the difference? So I don't like this feeling, but I have room for it. It's unpleasant, but I can accept it. I'm having the feeling of, a lot of times that's useful to articulate, even even sometimes verbally, I'm having a feeling of sadness right now. That helps to to cognitively separate your, your true self from the feelings that you're experiencing. The feelings are not you. They're something that you are experiencing. Right? Or the thought is not you. The thought is something that you're experiencing. Uh, so I'm having trouble with these thoughts, but they don't say anything about me. Just reinforce that truth. I don't want this, but right now I'm going to accept it. My feelings are like whether they will change. Uh, by God's grace and power, I can be content in this situation. That is a conscious choice based on faith that God is going to support you in that. Again, that's what Paul talks about in Philippians chapter 4. Yes, Keith? I guess it's a process of just getting older. It's just when you're created by faith, you, know, you when you see and, and you dwell on how God has faithfully taken care of other situations that you might be worried about, it, it gives you all the more ability to rest in him. Uh huh. Okay, he's done this before. Right. And why wouldn't he do this again? Exactly. Well, on two levels. One, on a personal level, experientially, uh, so the more that we walk with Christ and we develop a relationship with him, not, not, a, not necessarily a cognitive relationship, that's certainly important, but also an experiential relationship. Uh, so when Paul talks about the peace that surpasses understanding or the love that surpasses understanding, he's talking about not something that we cognitively understand by reading scripture. He's talking about a, an experiential knowledge that we develop as we walk through Christ through our life, right? And then Paul talks about in Romans that we have scripture, has all these examples to give us hope and encouragement, right? The same thing, okay? Uh, so yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Uh, so again, what acceptance is not, it's not believing your discomfort or, re- or resisting your discomfort or distracting your discomfort, avoiding putting up with, buying, resigning to, feeling, or diagnosing. Now, the latter one, when you're, you, there's nothing wrong with you're dealing with the situation. You, tr- you kind of step back, separate, try to figure out what's going on. What I'm talking about here is getting obsessed with trying to figure out why am I feeling this way? Or why am I having these thoughts? Well, the reason you're having those thoughts and you're feeling this way is because you're a broken creature living in a fallen world. That's just going to happen. So if you keep trying to diagnose yourself and try to understand all this stuff, again, you're not really accepting it. You're trying to still control it. Is this also true like with overanalyzation? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a classic problem with OCD. It's just you're constantly trying to overanalyze things. You're trying to find a solution because you're trying to control the situation. Exactly. 
So here's some sort of qualitative examples. Holding your discomfort as you would hold a delicate flower in your hand. That may sound a little new agey, but the, the concept is think about your discomfort as something that's not you. It's something you're experiencing. And, and try to approach it in for a more accepting or supportive perspective, okay? Think about uh, a, a crying child. Is a crying child potentially a stressful situation? All right? We don't throw the crying child away because it's causing us discomfort or embarrassment, do we? What do we do? We, we, we try to comfort the child or we take care of the child, even though we may be wanting to do something else, even though may we be... Uh, discomfort because people are looking at us. Maybe we're the one walking down the aisle on the plane with the baby, okay? All right. But, but we approach that discomfort different than a lot of times the discomfort that we have. And what I'm arguing is you need to think about it from that different perspective, okay? All right, so uh, sitting dis with your discomfort the way you would sit with a person who has a serious illness, Walking with your discomfort is the way you walk through carrying a sobbing infant, carrying your discomfort like you would carry a picture in your wallet, something that, that you have, that you're carrying around, but it's not who you are, okay? Just trying to get this different perspective on things. All right, so let me think of some biblical examples of acceptance. Think about Esther. How did Esther demonstrate acceptance? Think about the story of Esther. Remember, Mordecai came to her and said, look, they're going to wipe out the Jews. Uh, you need to go talk to the king. Why was she hesitant to do that? Because she, she could be killed, right? Unless she was invited into the presence of the king. Does anybody remember, basically, she uh, sort of uh, paraphrase her response ultimately, what she say? Yeah, she says, I will go in, maybe I'll get killed, but maybe I'm here for such a time exists. So she accepted that situation, the potential discomfort of going in and maybe being killed. She accepted that discomfort, but still acted on the truth in the midst of that. Everybody's, yeah, exactly. Uh, so we just talked about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. How did they accept their situation? Remember what they told King Nebuchadnezzar? They're not going to bounce. Says, God is able us to deliver us from this, uh, but even if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow down. Okay? So they accepted the, that situation and still acted. Uh, what about Mary? When the angel appeared to Mary, how did she respond to that? Was that an anxiety-provoking situation unlikely? Probably. What was her response in that situation? Anybody remember? This is Mary Magdalene, right? No, this is Mary, the mother of Jesus. She didn't feel worthy. Yeah. What else did she say? This basically paraphrasing, be, be unto me as your handmaiden. Okay. She accepted that. She, she acted in, through faith and accepted that. Uh, you look at James. James talks about we need to count it all joy when we go through trials why do we count it all joy why why can we have joy even while we're accepting discomfort okay we know that god is not in, is not hindered in the midst of our sorrow he can or our difficulty he can still work to accomplish his purpose and as we allow him to do that in the midst of that situation, there's multiple things that happen. We get to see him impact others through us. We get to experience God's glory and faithfulness in that situation. And we get to see how we start to get transformed in the process. So we, we, we accept the discomfort, but by faith we're trusting with God with the outcome. And by faith we're acting on that. And we can experience joy even in the midst of those discomforting emotions and mental struggle, struggles that we're having, okay? Uh, and then Peter talks about the same theme. In, in uh, First Peter, he talks about, you know, as you go through all these trials, you should rejoice 
because your, your faith is being refined like, like gold. So once again, we can accept and be, the only way you can be joyful in a bad situation is that you've had to accept that situation. You, you can't have joy unless you've accepted. If, if you haven't accepted the situation, then you're still trying to control the situation. Okay? So you really can't have joy until you surrender control to Christ and accept that and what's happening. Uh, and more specifically, I'm talking about in the context of our thoughts and our emotions that are still residual after we've implemented mindfulness and renewal. Uh, you can think about Paul. He says, I am, I am able to be content. I've learned the secret of all this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I would argue what Paul is talking about is he's learned to accept his situation, and he's relying on Christ to still be able to work in his situation, even though he's struggling with these these issues. We have all kinds of verses in the New Testament where there are evidence that Paul struggled with depression, anxiety. Uh, I've quoted some of those passages where Mary talks about he's constantly anxious about the welfare of the churches. He's got, but even though he, he has those emotions, in fact, he talks about this thorn in the flesh that he learned to accept so he could then rely on God to work th- through him in that situation. Uh, and so, again, because of that, we can boast in our infirmities. We can rejoice in our sufferings because of the outcome of the process. And then think about the example of Jesus. Uh, Paul talks about in Philippians how, how, how did Jesus accept the Father's circumstances that he was put into? Did he accept those? Right. Did that mean he did, did he like all those situations? Okay, so again, acceptance doesn't mean that you like what you're experiencing. So think of, think of Jesus' response in the garden. It says, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Why did he ask that? He, he, he did not prefer or really relish that discomfort he was experiencing then or he's going to experience, but he then accepted it by trusting the Father and the Father's will. So that's the dynamic that I'm trying to try to explain here from multiple perspectives. Does that make sense? Okay. So what are a couple of prerequisites for acceptance? What are some things that we need to do in order for acceptance to really work in our lives? The first of these, I would argue, is that we have to give up control. Does anybody else have problems with control? Just me? Okay. We think control is going to make things better in our life, don't we? If I'm in control, I can relax. Okay. So when we go on vacations, uh, I have this list. It's all laid out here. Okay. It drives my family crazy, and then they, in the past, sometimes would intentionally try to disrupt my schedule. Okay. Uh, Now, part of that's an OCD thing. Part of it is a control thing. I want everything to be in control because when I have things in control, I feel secure. I don't like the feeling of not being in control, of not knowing what's going to be done at 1035. I need to know that. That's really a control issue. But that level of control starts putting me into bondage. I'm now not in control. My schedule is controlling me. And so I need to learn to accept the discomfort of my schedule not going the way that I want. And actually, when you do that, you can actually experience more joy than you would in being in control. In fact, so bad, we'd get to the end of the day. My satisfaction came about by having to be able to check off my box that I did everything as opposed to actually experiencing the things that we did. Now, is that crazy? But that, that's how the bondage of control can start taking over things. So that's an example. Uh, so you have to give that up. All right? Jesus talks about giving that. Think about the rich run young ruler. Ultimately, he, he didn't want to give up his control of his life. Right? He had all these riches. It was a control issue. So you have to do that. 
You then have to trust Christ. If I'm going to, if I'm going to give up control, it means I have to trust Christ because I'm giving up control. I'm going to let him take control. And, and that's something we have to do. I love this passage in 1 Peter. Where Peter says, let those who suffer according to God's will, and for Christians, all of our suffering is, is under God's will, that we need to entrust our souls to a faithful creator while doing good. We trust God with our discomfort while we continue to pursue him. Somehow we've got in our mind as Christians, the objective is to get rid of all of our discomfort. We've made that the focus of our Christian life. That's not the focus. That's not the objective is for all your discomfort to go away. That's what heaven's for. Here on earth, our objective is to surrender control, follow Christ. We will continue to experience discomfort, but we are no longer in bondage to that because we've given over him so that we can have the freedom to continue to follow him, experience his glory, and reflect his glory in our lives. Okay? So again, by believing and trusting in Christ, also relying on Christ like Paul talks about. This is not something that you, you can do on your own. This is something that you have to rely on the Holy Spirit working through you to equip you to do. And I'll have some other analogies that will reinforce that. So relying on Christ, be courageous. It takes courage. It just drives me crazy sometimes people denigrate people that struggle with anxiety and say, well, they, you know, they're just weaklings or they're just, they don't have courage. The most courageous person or persons I've ever encountered are those that are dealing with anxiety disorders or OCD disorders that the only way to overcome that is they have to courageously face and take on their fear. So to accept discomfort takes some courage. But that requires faith for us to step out and do that. But you see this pattern over and over again in Scripture. God always calls on people to step out in courage, equipped by the faith that he has given them. That's the way the Christian life is. It's not all of our problems and discomfort go away. It's Christ has promised to walk with us through those situations requiring courage to act in those. So be strong and courageous. Don't be in fear or dread of them. I like to go back, especially in the Psalms, when, when David's talking about his enemies, sometimes I, I like to use that as a uh, personification of our anxious thoughts or emotions. These are the things we're engaged with. So just like here, I would apply this verse in Deuteronomy when he said, be in fear or dread of them. He's talking about the giants in the land. These are the same emotions and thoughts that we're struggling with. And, and here, the scriptures say, don't be afraid of those. Okay, I will be with you. I will not forsake you. You also have to learn to be thankful. I would argue that you can truly not be thankful of your situation unless you've accepted it. Does that make sense? If I'm not accepting my situation, then there's, I'm still holding back some thankfulness or gratitude to God for that. And when I do that, I start to get this mentality that I, I no longer trust God. That starts to creep into that situation. So thankfulness is really tied to very carefully or, or critically this concept of acceptance. So when you go back and look at Philippians chapter 4, when Paul's talking about this concept of anxiety, he says, don't be anxious about anything. And I would argue, stop to think about that. Are your emotions and your involuntary thoughts something? So, in essence, Paul is saying, don't be anxious about your anxious thoughts. Because there's something separate. We've already talked about our involuntary thoughts or, or emotions were something we're experiencing. Paul is saying, don't be anxious about your, uh, your anxious thoughts. Okay, why is that? And then he says, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Sometimes we read that verse and you, you forget there's this little admonition there, with thanksgiving. It's tied into, it's operative of that promise. We, we have to be doing that with thanksgiving. Because in thanksgiving, the word implicitly implies there's an acceptance that's gone with that. All right, so I, 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 I can learn no longer to be anxious about these situations that I'm dealing with because I've accepted those 
in God's will, and I'm thankful for them, tying back to what Peter and James talk about, because I know how that's going to be transformative in my life as the Holy Spirit's working through that situation, and I also can be thankful because I know it is not a barrier to me fulfilling my purpose in Christ. In fact, it may actually be the conduit that God wants to use to do that. So be thankful, and then that goes on to uh, some other uh, verses. Uh, These are two great books that talk about the concept of thankfulness. I've mentioned these before by Ann Voskamp. The first one is 1,000 Gifts. Anybody read that? So she goes through and through this, her experiences, and she's got some pretty traumatic experiences. Uh, she ends up writing a list of a thousand things that she's thankful for. Uh, it's just a good way to, of a primer to kind of give you some perspective on that. She's up, subsequently come out with another book called The Broken Way that looks again at this issue that brokenness can be the way that God can use us to minister to others, even in the context of those that are struggling with anxiety and depression. Okay, so two, two really good books. So following on with uh, the latter part of that verse in Philippians, which says, be anxious for nothing. And then it says, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your thoughts. And a lot of times we just stop there. What does the latter part of that verse say? In Christ Jesus. A lot of times we try to make that some uh, magical incantation that if we just repeat that verse over and over again, we expect our anxiety and depression to go away because we're trying to control that and use that verse as a magical piece to get rid of that. We're still engaged in avoidance. When the key to interpreting that whole passage about anxiety is tied back to the last part of that verse where it says, in Christ Jesus. Our security is not in ourselves, it's in Christ Jesus. It's tied in our identity in Christ Jesus. So as I'm experiencing anxiety or anxious thoughts or depressive thoughts, I need to realize my identity is not tied into those. My identity is in Christ. And in Christ, I, I, they have no effect on me. They have no control over me. Because I've now surrendered control from trying to control those things. I've stepped into my identity in Christ, and now I've given my control to Christ, and he's in control. So I don't have to fight that. I can accept that in my identity. Yes, Sam? Sam? Uh-huh. As I slow down and focus on my breathing and remember that truth that the Lord is at hand. Right. So those techniques of mindfulness can help you experience being in Christ. Right. Yeah, it's like I talked about, you can separate, you can observe your thoughts, but then re-engage with the vertical dimension, right, uh, with the Holy Spirit as you do that in the observing chair is the analogy I used, right? Okay. Uh, again, resting in Christ, so being in Christ's identity and then recognizing that our rest comes in Christ. So as I give up control, I accept my situation, the discomfort, I then step into Christ, I rest in him. That's where I can find true rest. Because I'm Number one, I'm not spending all my energy trying to avoid fighting all this. It's letting go of the rope. Okay. Uh, and then how can we do that? A couple of ways we can abide in him cognitively by being in his word. That's kind of what we looked at last week. We talked about a lot of different ways to get God's truth into our lives, uh, changing our perspectives, our beliefs, and our judgments. Uh, And then the other way, and, and Keith talked about this a little bit, was this concept of experiential knowledge. So in John, Jesus talks about abiding not only in his word, but also in his love. That is, in, in, abiding in a relationship with him. And then Paul talks about this, this concept of knowing the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. And what he's talking about here is, I can know something about Christ's love by reading about him in Scripture, but I also can know something more deeply about him experientially 
through my daily walk with him, my fellowship with him. And paradoxically, one of the ways we can experience Christ most intimately is through what Paul talks about, the fellowship of his suffering. That in our suffering, Christ is closest to us. But paradoxically, we don't, we, don't, we don't want to be in that. And so a lot of the times we, we don't have as an intimate relationship with Christ as we want is because the very place that he is, we're trying to avoid. Instead of accepting that, and as we accept and, and sit in the room with that discomfort, we show that Christ comes up and appears in that room with us. We have the opportunity to experience that. A lot of times we've foregone those experiences because we're trying constantly to get away from that, the very thing that God is trying to use to get close to us through. Okay. And so that's why he can go on and talk about that very concept that he wants to share in his sufferings because he knows experientially from what he's lived through that in his sufferings, Christ has been most closely aligned or there with him. Uh, and then in Corinthians, he talks about that Christ wants to shine. Just like God created the universe out of darkness, he wants to shine his light into our hearts, again, from this experiential knowledge base that we can then have that intimacy and confidence based on what God has done in the past. We can now trust him in the future with our discomfort and still act in faith and trust him. Recognizing that as we do that, that God then starts to use those experiences to transform us as well. The paradox of this is that's the same process that Christ went through. I mean, Hebrews has got a very odd verse there. It's somewhat mysterious. It says that Christ learned obedience through what? Anybody complete that? Through suffering. It says Christ learned obedience through suffering. Christ was perfect, but even his human self, <clears throat> he was transformed through suffering. And if that was the process that God used with Christ, why do we think we would be any different? Okay. Suffering is the pathway that God wants to use in many cases to sanctify us, and it's the one pathway we constantly try to avoid. And acceptance is the doorway to start to accept that and start to see what God has to say there. Okay. So uh, a couple of analogies here. This is in Matthew 14, 23. There's this story about uh, a storm comes up. The disciples are out uh, at sea. Uh, and Jesus is in the back of the boat there asleep. Uh, there's actually two stories. If, if you ever think about it, there's two stories with Jesus out on the water in a storm. So the first one, I think those are put there sequentially for a purpose, both in Matthew and Mark. The first one, what's going on? The storm comes up. Uh, the disciples are fighting the storm. Jesus is asleep in the back there. And what are the, what are the, the uh, disciples' reactions? Anybody remember? Yeah, they say, don't you care? First of all, what are the disciples trying to do as the storm comes up? They're trying to bail water. They're trying to control the situation, aren't they? How's that working out for them? Not so well. What is Jesus doing? He's sleeping. Okay? And Jesus is, is, Jesus got, Jesus is with them in the boat. Instead of turning, relying on him, they're trying to control the whole situation. And finally, when they realize this isn't working, they come to Jesus. But what do they say to Jesus? Don't you care? I want to think about your own experience. Have you, have you developed these struggles? You're trying to control everything. Things aren't working out. And then what do we tend to do? What do we say to God? Don't you care I'm experiencing this? How could you let this be happening? Why are you sleeping? Okay, do we act sometimes like that? Sure, okay. Uh, and Jesus then says, you know, why, why are you guys 
worry about this. All right? He calms the sea. Uh, and so the solution was right there with them. Instead, they're trying to control. Uh, the, other, the other example is in Matthew 22, 33. Uh, again, we've looked at this before. In this case, once again, there's a storm. The disciples are trying to do what? They're trying to control things. And then Jesus comes along. How is this story different from the previous one? He comes to them. Okay. Why are they afraid? Are the disciples afraid? Yes, they're afraid. Okay. Why are they afraid? The storm. Why else are they afraid? They're terrified. The scripture says they were terrified because they saw Jesus and they thought he was a ghost. Okay, so they're dealing with all of these, these fears and terrors. All right? So Jesus comes out and asks Peter to come towards him. Again, I've, I've mentioned this before. Did Jesus stop the storm so, so, so Peter could kind of walk out there serenely to him? No, he didn't. It says they, they were experiencing waves and wind. I want to use those analogies as emotions and thoughts. They were experiencing those. God, Christ did not stop that. He asked them to exercise faith, turn over control to him, accept the situation. Even in the presence of those emotions and thoughts, and then act on faith and, and go to Jesus. In this case, in both cases, where was Jesus? He was in the storm. I'd like to suggest to you that what we perceive as necessarily bad situations as storms, and we say, where is God? I would suggest to you, God is in the storm. He's wanting to meet you. He's asking you to come and step out in faith and trust him. The paradox is we expect him to get rid of all of our anxiety and sadness or emotions. But he says, those aren't important. Just trust me. Accept those situations and in the midst of that, still follow me. Still step out and trust me. Okay. All right. So those are two, two stories. Go back and there's a lot, there is a lot in there that we could mine. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time. Uh, how do we continue to maintain this as you're starting to make progress? You need to continue to act on the truth, just like Peter did in this story here. We can also rest in his promises. I love this passage in 1 Peter I've, I've used before, where, where Christ promises that he will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. So even though you may be experiencing the discomfort, you can act in faith with this promise. And then also recognizing that God is transforming our experiences and actually mining, in essence, a weight of glory that we're going to receive when we get to heaven. Now, you know I like movies. There are a couple ones I would recommend. There's actually some film clips that you could pull up. Uh, the first of these is St. Crispin's Day Speech by Henry V. Anybody see this before? This is the most inspiring speech you'll ever see. So there's all kinds of spiritual uh, analogies here. So Henry V and his troops are in France. They're surrounded by like a, the French around number, like five to one. It looks like they're all going to die. Uh, and he rallies the troops with this impassioned speech. I, I recommend that you look at that. And really, the king here is somewhat a, a type of Christ. And I want you to think about your struggles as you're sort of in a storm. It may look hopeless, but Christ is there with you. And he calls his troops together and, and uh, rallies them around this concept of, of a fellowship with the king. Christ is in our suffering, and in that suffering, there is a fellowship that we have with him. And the struggles that we go through, analogous to in this, this clipper, talks about the wounds that the soldiers are going to experience. One day they'll look at as badges of, of honor that they've experienced because it was in fellowship with the king. The same way that we have depressive and anxiety traumas that we have that are scars in our life, one day when we get to heaven, those are going to be badges of honor that we've experienced in fellowship with Christ that we can, we can use to glorify him. 
So it's, it's a way, another way visually to look at that. Uh, another great clip that I've used before is Mr. Holland's opus, which again, you think about the struggles that you go through, you think no one cares, no one knows about. God knows. In fact, in, in Psalms, it says God's keeping track of every single tear that you have. He holds them in his bottle. It says, are not they recorded in his book? And we get to heaven, all the things that you struggle with by acting in faith, even in the midst of your discomfort, one day will be displayed when those books are opened and the universe will see the faithfulness that you've, you've exerted and that the uh, way that you've trusted God in those situations. And by way of analogy, it'll be more glorious than what Mr. Holland experienced, this weight of glory uh, that God will give us. This week, I'll give you an essay by C.S. Lewis called The Weight of Glory that kind of captures the essence of that concept. I hope that I'll give you some hope relative to going forward. Uh, so just by way of a quick review, this was kind of our cognitive model. We went out the first week. We kind of surveyed things. Week two, we kind of looked at the environmental stressors, some of the physical response. Week three, we looked at emotions and feelings and some of the biochemistry issues. Uh, week four, we looked at some of the cognitive issues, the, the difference between involuntary and voluntary thoughts, concept of mindfulness. Uh, last week, we looked at these things that can influence those, our perspective, beliefs, and judgments. And this week, we've kind of looked at how do we deal with that emotional discomfort, our desire to get rid of it. And I would argue the way to get through that is to embrace that through acceptance so that we can then be... Um, obedient in following Christ. Uh, if you didn't pick out one of the surveys, if you got in late, if you have a chance, if you could fill one of those out, either in the service or later, and I'll leave that box back there if you want to drop those down. I'd love to get feedback from you all. Uh, again, this Wednesday, we'll have another, our final Q&A sharing session. We meet in room 100. If you want to show up for that, uh, that would be great. And with that, I went over a little bit, but pretty much on schedule. So thank you all for being here with this course. I hope this has been helpful to you. Uh, you have my email. So if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to send me uh, any emails. I know I've given you enough material, at least for six months probably, uh, if not more than that. So uh, yeah. So anyway, thank you all for, for attending. And uh, let me close with the word of prayer. Dear God, just thank you so much for our time together. Thank you for the truth of your word, Lord, that uh, how uh, you want to work through our suffering uh, to draw us closer to you, transform our lives, uh, experience your glory, and share that to those around us. Just help us to do that in the coming weeks and months ahead. In Christ Jesus' name, amen.